Okay, that's time. Take what you got. All right, so what'd you think? It's like the homework? Yep. All right, let's go through it real quick. I can't promise you that I'll always review a quiz, but uh, today I think we can. All right, so the first one, we want to take the limit as x approaches negative 3 of the function f. So we are approaching an x value of negative 3, which is here, and we're approaching it from which side? Both sides, right? Because it doesn't have a little plus or minus up to the top right of it. So from the left, where is this headed? A y value of 1, and from the right, it's headed to 1 also. So the answer for A is 1. For B, we're approaching 2 from the left side. So here's 2. We need to go figure out where we are on the function, and then come in from the left side. We're coming in this way. The y value is negative 2. So this is negative 2. From the right side, same thing. We're coming in from the right this time, which means we're up here. And we're approaching positive 2. The limit as we approach 2 without saying left or right means we have to look at both sides, which is what part uh, B and C were. And those turned out to be two different answers, which means that this limit does not exist. D and E is what I was looking for there. And then on part E, F of 2, that's college algebra. Go to 2, plug in the point here, 1. So those were the answers for the first one. All right, this one, the answers are going to vary depending on how you drew it. But uh, the way I would have done this, I would have started out with the stuff I know. So f of 3 is 1. So if I go out to 3, I go up 1, I should have a dot there. Um, f of negative 1 should be negative 2. So at negative 1, I go down, negative 2, I put a dot. So, so far, I've got some partial credit, right? Now, this one. The limit as I approach negative 1 from both the left and the right, because it doesn't say, has to be 1. So if I approach negative 1 from the left and from the right, I need to be headed to a y value of positive 1, which means I need to be headed to this point right here, right? But I have to leave it as an open circle because I'm defined down here, right? So just something coming out the left side and something coming out the right side doesn't matter how you do it. So far, that's, that's all I'm going to put. And then as I approach 3 from the left, I need to be headed towards 0. So if I approach the x value of 3 from the left side, I need to be headed down to a y value of 0. So I'm put an open circle here. And just tail that off like that. As I approach 3 from the right-hand side, though, I need to be headed up to positive infinity. So that means that I need to do something like, like that. So just draw it. Like this, and I can even put that if I want. And that's everything, right? Now what I need to do is complete the picture by drawing a function, which must pass the vertical line test. So I'm just going to connect any pieces that aren't connected together. Like from here to here, I can connect that. I can do whatever I want here, right? That's fine. Or you could just curve it or a straight line, whatever you want. Then out this side, I can just, you know, do that, and then over here, you know, something like that. Done. Understand? Answers may vary. And then the last one. One. Okay. So I'll, I'm going to bring up the notes from the course video that this came from is me just going through the notes. That's all it is. And the notes that I went through are right here. I'm going to make these a little bigger. I'll go even bigger. Ooh. Doesn't look good when I go this big on here. Um, but if you get down to, it's towards the very end. Here it is. Look at what it says here. And I even, who watched it? I know a lot of you didn't, it's okay. Who watched this though, anyone? Yes? Okay, so I was pretty, pretty uh, adamant about these being important, right? I mean, these were, so if you are going through your notes before you come to class and it says something like know these, this is, 
They're very important, then that's probably something that you should know walking into class the next day. So these two limits are very difficult for us to show why they are one and why they are zero at this point. All we're going to do is use them. Later on, I'll show you why this is true, all right? But for now, we just have to take it on faith. But that's way late in the notes, and we need to go back up to the top. So any questions or comments or concerns about what just happened? Y'all OK? I don't remember you covering it in the syllabus, but did we drop the lowest quiz grade, or is every quiz grade that accounted for? If we keep at the pace that we're on right now, which is to have a quiz every week, you should have anywhere between you know, 14 to 16 quizzes. I don't mind dropping two if we have that many. It all depends on how many we have. If we wind up with only six, then you know, I don't know about dropping one. Usually if I have eight or more, I'll drop one. If we get up to past like 14, I'll, I'll drop two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so no other uh, comments or questions about anything? Oh, yes. So Mm -hmm. I, the, way I, the way I'm grading these is kind of, uh, it's partial for each one, yeah. So if you got like part of it right, the other part's wrong, I'll, I'll kind of weight it that way. You know, if, yeah, so it will be a weighted thing. It's not like if you miss one of them, the whole thing's wrong, right? Except for that last one. Yeah. So yeah. Like, That's the way I graded my other calculus class. Now, I, here's what I think I'm going to do, because I already know people that did really well in the first two and would have 100 are going to wind up with like a 70 or so because of that last problem. So here's, here's a promise I'll make to you. Since this was the first quiz, and this is kind of just getting us all on the same path, if that 70 comes back to haunt you, and prevent you from a letter grade that you could have achieved without that 70, then I will entertain the idea of, of replacing it and getting rid of it. But for now, let's live with that reminder of what you need to do, okay? Sound fair? All right. Okay, so today is about calculating limits. Everything we've done up to this point last class was all graphical. I show you a picture of a function. We talk about limits from left and right. And then towards the end, I gave you some limits and some conditions and we drew the graph. So everything was visual. Now what we want to do is we want to be able to comp compute a limit of a function without having to draw a graph, without relying on a picture, just by hand, algebraically computing a limit. And this is where things start to get a little bit hairy in here, right? It's going to get a little messy because it's all going to depend on your algebraic skill. How good are you at algebra, right? And the better you are, the easier this is going to be. It's, it comes down to that. So, but I will take you by the hand most of the way, and I am open to you stopping me and asking me, you know, like, how did you do that step? Or any, I'm not going to leave a lot to you this first day. When you get home and do your homework, you'll probably get hung up on some things, and that's why I put the videos up for you, right? But I could show you a thousand limit problems today, and you could still face one that you haven't seen at some point in time. So it's really about your comfort level with algebra. Like, how, how good do you feel about your factoring skills, you know? We'll see. We'll, we'll, you'll know by the end of class how, how to feel, I think. All right, so we're going to do the, everything by hand. But to do it by hand, we have to use some rules. And in fact, we call these the limit laws. And there are a bunch of them. And that's what I talk about in that video. And I'm not going to go through all these laws right now. They're all in the book. They're all in your notes. And I, I will refer to them. Like, I know I'm going to refer to this one here today, limit law four says if you're taking the limit of the product of two functions, you are allowed to take the limit of each function separately. So it's like you can split it up into two limits. So when I do that later, I'm referring back to these laws. Yes, like log properties, right? 
same thing. These are all things that we uh, reference back to. The, the important thing, I guess, to, to get from this is that these laws had to be established and proved first. Later on, we're going to see something where we're going we're to be trying to do something later where we have a product. And you would think that you can just do the same thing on each one and multiply the answers. And it's not that case. So with limits, you can just separate it into two separate limits. If you have division, you're allowed to separate it into two different limits on the top and the bottom. All right? The ones that I will talk about before we proceed are these last, well, the seven, eight, nine. I just want to give you an example of each one of them real quick. So an example of seven. If you were asked to find the limit, let's say as x approaches three, of the number five. So I'm taking the limit of a constant. It's five. The answer is five. And the reason is because we're saying, what happens to five when you let x go to three? But there is no x in this expression, right? So changing x has no effect on five. Five is always just five. So what is it going to head to? Five is going to head to five. It's just going to be five. That's it. Now this one says something like, what is the limit as x approaches, let's go with a different number, four of x? The answer should be four. So, I mean, because it's kind of a dumb question. It's like, what's x going to if x is going to four? Right? What is x going to if x is going to four? Well, it's headed to four, right? You just told me it's headed to four, so it's going to four. And then this one would look something like this. What's the limit as x goes to 2 of x to the third power? It's, well, what's, he, what's this headed to? 2. 2 to the third power. 2 times 2 times 2. So that should be headed to 8, right? So these limit laws just tell you you're allowed to do these things, right? If it's just x, just replace it with whatever it's headed to. If it's x to a power, you just plug in the x, right? Essentially. All right. <clears throat> now, we're going to be trying to calculate these limits by hand. And we're going to be looking at a lot of crazy functions. And when we, do our, when we start doing these by hand, the first thing we're always going to do when we try and compute them is this thing called direct substitution. We are going to take the limit of the function and we are just going to try and replace every single x we see with whatever the x is headed towards with that little arrow. We will try that direct substitution. If when we do that, we don't have any issues, then the answer we get is the answer it is. Right? That, I mean, that's our answer. What do I mean by issues? What are the things that are going to be problems for us? If we see 0 over 0, that's going to be a problem. If you see 0 on the bottom, just either way, right? Even if this is just some number up here, it doesn't matter what it is. Division by 0 is not going to be good. We won't do imaginary. I'm glad you brought that up. We've all heard of imaginary numbers. And I think, I know in our class I told you I didn't like talking about them because we don't, fo we don't focus on them too much. In fact, the, this entire book, okay, sh is, should be called um, Calculus of a Single Real Variable. Or no, you know what? This has Cal 3 in it. Never mind. Calculus of Real Variables, which means that the entire book is based upon the real number system. Imaginary numbers are not allowed. Not allowed. So we will never talk about imaginary numbers in here. All right? Just forget about them for now. All right? Now, if we ever get a square root of a negative number, we'll say no solution. But we won't start bringing i in here. Pardon? Uh, no, if we see something like, uh, well, later on, there's going to be a bunch. We're going to have a bunch of things we have to worry about. For today, this is really the, the one that we want to focus on. As we proceed through next week, we'll, see, we'll start adding more bad situations that could happen. But let's just tackle the main one right now. If you ever want to take a math class that deals with imaginary numbers, then you take a class called complex variables. And that's where you basically learn about all of the calculus, but in complex numbers, which is 
different ball game. All right, so math majors. Did I have math major in here? I thought I had a math major in here, no? Okay, so you'll have the pleasure of doing that later. And it is a pleasure, I, I assure you, you'll enjoy it. It's very visual, it's very cool. All right, so when we do this direct substitution property, we kind of have a little bit of a shortcut, all right? <clears throat> and the shortcut is right here, this property, the direct substitution property. If the function you're trying to take the limit of is a polynomial, a rational function, these are co uh, college algebra functions. If it's a trig function, pre-cal function, exponential or log function, college algebra, any of those functions, if you're trying to take the limit and letting x approach a of that function, whatever it is, the answer is just f of a. It's just plug, plug the value in and you're done. It's very straightforward. So long as the a is in the implied domain of the function. So I'll give you an example. Limit x approaches 2 of x minus 2 over x squared minus 4. Uh, no, 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 no. Let's go to 3. Sorry about that. All right, what type of function is this? Y'all okay with this? I like this, but sometimes I feel like it's a little too much. Is that all right? Okay. I mean, because I could just do this, right? This is a rational function. Okay, rational function from college algebra, right? From way back when somewhere, right? What is a rational function? <clears throat> it's a polynomial function divided by another polynomial function. Anytime you have the ratio of two polynomials, <coughs> it's irrational. <coughs> Excuse me. So I should just be able to plug three into this and get an answer as long as three as long as 3 is in the implied domain of that function. By implied domain, we mean what numbers can you plug into this? And what, maybe we should look at what can't you plug in? You can't plug in 2 and you can't plug in negative 2. Agreed? If you factor out the bottom, x plus 2 times x minus 2, those, that means that 2 and negative 2 can't be plugged into this. But see, we're going to 3. This should be able to handle everything else except 2 and negative 2. So if this is headed towards 3, I should just be able to plug in 3 and I'll be, I'll be done. So let me try it. 3 into here, we get 3 minus 2 is 1. 3 here, squared, 9, minus 4, 5, 1 fifth. So if I were to graph this, okay, if I were to sit here and graph that function, here's what I can tell you. That if I go out to 3, I can promise you that it's headed towards one-fifth from both the left and the right. I'm not, even, I'm not even looking at what's happening at three. It turns out that if I actually plug in three, I get this. But because three was not a problem, the answer is just what you would expect it to be. Does that make sense? Yes? This is nice, but it's not interesting at all. We're not interested, we are not interested in taking limits of functions where they are well behaved. We're more interested in taking a limit of this at a place that it doesn't like, which would be where? 2 and negative 2, right? That would be a more interesting question. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and address that. Let's do it right now. So I'm supposed to do a bunch of problems right now, right? That's what I'm supposed to do if you follow the notes. I'm, I'm supposed to do a bunch of the problems out of the book, which I've done a lot of them on video already. So what I've done is I just went to another textbook because I have a bunch of textbooks sitting in my office, is ripped out of a calculus book, opened it up to limit calculations, and I took a picture of the page. So I'm gonna use that. I'm not texting anyone or anything, okay? So I'm not breaking my own rules here. I'm just gonna look at some problems. Um, I'm gonna do a bunch of them. And we're gonna get start off easy and we're going to work our way to more difficult, more challenging problems. So <clears throat> let's do it. Where's my, I would like for us to look at our first calculating a limit by hand, the limit 
as x approaches 2 of x minus 2 over x squared minus 4. <clears throat> From what we just discussed, I can't use the direct substitution property and just, boom, pops an answer out and we're done, right? Because I know that I have a problem at 2. I have division by 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a little arrow, and I'm not going to draw an equal sign because I'm not saying that this is equal to this. I'm just thinking about what happens when I apply the limit to this. What happens as I let x go to 2? The top gets closer to what? 0, right? Gets really close to 0. And the bottom also gets really, really close to 0, right? Because 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. So we get this, this form, OK? I'm going to call that a form. This is the form we're getting. The limit gives us a form of 0 over 0, which is a very bad situation for us. And I like to actually write the word bad. It's kind of childish, but it sticks, all right? That is bad. What do we, see, what do, we do when we see this situation? We don't give up. We don't box 0 over 0 and say that's our answer. We have to do some algebra now. We have to do something. It's up to us to determine what this function does near 2. 0, 0 is not an answer. So what tools do we have? Well, we have to do some algebra. So what kind of algebra do we just look at that, and what's the first algebra thing that pops into your mind? You can, you can factor the denominator because it's a difference of squares. So let's just rewrite the limit right now. <clears throat> I'm going to write it factored like this. And then, do you see it? <clears throat> you see the x minus 2 and x minus 2 will cancel, right? And when I do that, things are going to become very nice. It'll be 1 over x plus 2, right? But time out for a second. Time out. I need you to be able to pause your brain, if possible, and think about something that I'm going to put over here. Before we cancel, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. I'm going to write two functions down right here. f of x is 1, and g of x is x over x. And I'd like for you to look at those for a moment and tell me if they're the same function or not. Can be? No, yes. I'm hearing yes and no. I'm seeing yes and no's. Yes. Should we vote? No? Let's, let's, come on, we can vote. No one's going to, you know, be humiliated. It's not like you're on camera or anything. Okay. So how many of you think those are the same functions? How many of you think that those are not the same functions? Okay, <clears throat> let me graph them. What does f of x equals 1 look like? It's always 1, right? Always. It looks like that. You know why? Okay, so what does this one look like? It looks the same, but it's got a hole at 0. At 0, it's not defined. Because if you try and plug 0 into that, you get 0 over 0, right? And it's not defined there. That means at 0, nothing's happening. But anywhere else, it's like what? 1 over 1 is 1. 2 over 2 is 2. I mean, sorry, 2 over 2 is 1. 3 over 3 is 1. 4 over 4 is 1. Right? Negative 1 over negative 1 is positive 1. So it should look almost the same, except here it's undefined. These are not the same functions. Now, what might have made you believe that they were the same functions is because you've been told, look, x over x is 1, right? Anything over itself is 1. So I think a lot of you said, it. sure, I just cancel those out, and then this is 1, and they're the same, right? When you cancel factors within an expression algebraically, you must promise me that, that, will never be, that these will never be 0. See, you, you've, you've actually, when you make that cancellation, you have a little asterisk down at the bottom that says um, x can't be 0. This is equal to this. If x isn't 0, it's true. Right? If x is not 0, these are the same functions. But if x is 0, can't do it. So back to this. You want me to cancel x minus 2, right? 
I'm okay with that as long as you promise me that neither one of these factors will be zero. That means you need to promise me that x minus 2 will not be zero. Move the negative over. That means you have to promise me that x cannot be 2. Can you promise me x cannot be 2? How? How can you promise me that? It's going to get close to 2, right? This limit is the thing that allows us to do this. We're saying we're going to let x get close to 2 without actually ever being 2. And that's critical that, that we have this out here because it allows us to do that. Understand? So with that in mind, now we can proceed. This is equal to the limit as x approaches 2 of 1 over x plus 2. After you cancel the factors, you can do that. Now at this point, we can do direct substitution because what we're looking at no longer has a domain issue, right? Just direct substitution into this. Let x go to 2, and what do you get? 1 fourth. So if I graph this, if I were to graph this as a function right now, if I were to pull up my graphing utility and graph it, I can promise you that as I approach 2 from the left and from the right, the y value should be approaching 1 fourth. And I did that all without looking at the picture, right? Anyone have a question? So you said, you said uh, the, the thing that allows it to be done is the limit going to 2 mm -hmm. allows it to show that it's not going to be a 0. I didn't quite understand. Okay. I'll, what I was trying to say here is this algebraic cancellation is allowed as long as you promise me that, that x can't be 2. Because right. if x is 2, this is 0 over 0 and it's undefined. But we're about to, what we're saying with this is, look, we're going to let x get real close to 2 without being 2. So that will never be 0. It'll be really close to 0, but it won't be 0. Okay. And now you might be saying, but wait a minute, here, didn't you just let it be 2? Right? So I didn't. Look, I'm letting this right here get really close to 2. What is a number that's really close to 2 plus a number that's, that is 2? That's a number that's really close to 4, right? Really close. And what's 1 divided by a number that's really close to 4? It's 1 over 4, right? It's close to it. Look, this is a limit. We're saying that as x goes to 2, this expression approaches this value. We're not saying that it ever gets there, right? This was the whole idea of the hole in the graph. You're coming in and you're getting closer and closer to a y value without ever achieving that y value. You actually never get to it. But it's not like you're going and all of a sudden you go somewhere else. It's only going to one value and that value is one fourth. That allows you to cancel factors. Okay. So if you didn't have that, then it would be a problem. What you did in college algebra when you were canceling factors is every single time you did it, you should have been saying this. But a lot of times, that's not stressed in college algebra courses. That automatically you're pulling numbers out that you are saying you're no longer allowed to use. Okay. I hope that ma makes sense. These two functions are equivalent. As long as x isn't 0, they're the same thing. Okay. If x is 0, this one isn't defined. Okay. Nice. All right, sorry. That, that was more just because I need to make sure that we're being precise here. And I can't just cancel factors out of nowhere. I mean, I just can't. You couldn't do it back in algebra, and I can't do it today. But like I said, back in algebra, I think it would be harder to explain why. Maybe? I don't know. has to be the number that's... The, like, word x is going to 2, you have to use that. Yes. Uh-huh. Yep. All right, so I thought what I would do, just to verify the mathematics here, is... Oh, this is it. This is the graph. I happen to have had it already typed in there. This is the graph of um, x minus 2 over x squared minus 4. And if I, if I look at my x value here, as I approach 2... So 
Oh, what happened there? I got to two, what happened? The computer freaked out. That's, that's why it turned red, and if I let it go, it says one over zero, infinity encountered, and it freaks out. That's because you can't plug two in. But if I go just to the left of it, you can see that it is approaching something, right? And that, that value that it's approaching is exactly one fourth, one fourth high. That's how tall it is. You can probably, there we go. Zoomed in a little bit more for you there. Let me zoom in a little bit. There. So you see two right here? As we move in, it's approaching one fourth. Now, it's kind of misleading because if you, if you graph this on your graphing calculators, it's not going to show you a hole. It doesn't show it to you. It, it gives you the impression that you could just draw this without picking up your pencil. But there is, in fact, a hole right here in this graph that I can't see. Understand? OK. Let's do another one. That was, that was kind of interesting. Let's do, let me grab these problems here. Oh yeah, yeah, I like this one. Limit x approaches 3 of 3 minus x over x squared minus 9. <clears throat> the first thing you're going to do when you're faced with the limit, the first step, is determine what the form of the limit is. So that's where I drew that little arrow. And I just try direct substitution to see what happens. And I think this one's pretty obvious, right? What are you having? Zero over zero? Zero over zero is bad. And zero over zero tells me I need to come in with some sort of algebra or later on some sort of trick almost. It's almost like a trick that you'll use. But for now, it's just algebra. And I can hopefully resolve this with just algebra. Keeping in mind the whole time that what we're going to try and avoid is having this division by zero. We don't want that to be there anymore. Difference of squares, again. Numerator is uh, 3 minus x. Denominator is x plus 3 times x minus 3. Can I cancel? Not quite, right? They don't match up, right? This is 3 minus x, x plus 3. Yeah, how about we, we notice that these two right here, <coughs> these two factors, <coughs> are off by a sign. This is positive 3, that's negative 3. That's negative x, that's positive x. So since they're off by a sign, what I can do is just pull a negative out, factor a negative out of the numerator. A negative 1 pulled out would give me negative 3 plus x. <coughs> like that. We all agree? And we only do that just so that these two match, right? These are the same, even though they're not written exactly the same, they are the same. So now I can cancel these out, so long as I promise you that x is not 3 which it's not because I'm in a limit. It's not going to be 3. It's going to be real close to 3, but not 3. And I rewrite limit again. x approaches 3. And then on top we have negative 1, and on the bottom we have x plus 3. And now at this point, take the limit, like do the direct substitution. You get what? Negative 1 sixth. Notice that when I did this work, every single statement, limit, blah, 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 equals limit, blah, 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 equals limit, blah, 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 equals no more limit. When did the limit go away? When I actually plugged in the value of 3. Your limit needs to be there the whole time, too, all right? When you're doing this, it's the proper way to write things. If you, if you drop your limit and just start doing algebra, Without carrying your limit, I will take off for that. I won't be like super critical, but I will, you know, you want to you want to be writing correctly. It's like, you know, periods at the end of sentences, and I mean, it's that type of thing. No questions? I'm assuming it's really important uh, to get the notation right now, later. 
yeah, if you don't get it, if you don't get it down now, it's it's going to be hard to incorporate it into your work later. I think. All right, is this okay? All right, all right. I do want to recap though that what we're saying here is that if we look at this function as x approaches three from both the left and the right, the function, this function equals this? No. This function approaches this, right? It gets closer to this. See, this is what we were talking about. Did we have the discussion about what close is last time? I don't know how deep we got into that. I don't think we did. Are we close? Is this too close for you? No, this is okay, right? Like, am I close to you right now? Compared to SeaWorld, are we close? Okay. So I'm, I'm far, far away from SeaWorld then. Compared to the sun, how, is, the, is SeaWorld close to me compared to the sun? See, it's, it's relative. And so closeness is a word that is kind of frowned upon in mathematics because everyone's idea of close is different. When I say x is getting close to 3 and this function is getting close to negative 1 sixth, that actually does not fly when it comes down to rigorous mathematics. And for my one math Major, what's your name, sir? Anthony. Anthony, you will, you will be taught later on when you take courses like Foundations of Analysis, Real Analysis. Two, those are two of the bigger courses uh, that introduce you to this. You go back to this, and they give you precise definitions for this. There is a more precise definition for the limit. The book talks about it. It's called the Delta Epsilon um, definition, and we actually get rid of the whole ambiguity that there is with, with closeness. For here, we're talking in terms of closeness and we're all kind of in agreement that we're okay with knowing that it's a big gray area. All right? I just, I want you to know that we're not saying that this function equals this ever. We're saying that this function gets close to that. It's kind of like the complex zeros. Mm, I don't know. No, if this, some Cal 1 courses are, will, would, uh, I've done Cal 1 courses here about, you know, 10 years ago where I was teaching the delta epsilon definition of limits. It's brutal. And you really don't need it unless you're going to be a math major. You really don't need it. So I've kind of taken it out. And I don't know of many instructors that do, still do it, like formally do it. All right, you ready? Continue. Limit x approaches 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 over x squared minus 5x plus 6. So we try first just to direct substitution, see what form we have. Always make sure you do that first. What happens, what I see a lot of students do is, you know, in a week, a week from now, you're doing limits, and you're so used to like, okay, I just, I know I need to factor this, that you forget the direct substitution, and you realize that this was never zero over zero. Like, you plug in and it turned out to be like three over five and the answer was just three fifths and you should have been done. But you spent 15 minutes factoring for no reason, right? So always do the direct substitution first. And you'll probably get mad at me when it's on a test and I'm like, that was, you didn't have to do all that work and you'll probably get mad at me about it, but I'm telling you right now, always do the direct substitution. So do we have a problem? We do. We are gonna get zero over zero though. Let me just do it real quick. We get 9 minus 3 minus 6 on top, and we get 9 minus 15 plus 6 on the bottom, and that is 0 over 0, and that's bad. So when we see bad, we say algebra time. The previous uh, two problems, difference of squares, right? That's what got us to where we need to go. This time, factoring trinomials. You got to be able to factor a trinomial. 
So this limit as x approaches 3 is, let's see, what is that up top? Minus 3 plus 2? And the denominator? I'm hearing different things here. Minus 2 minus 3. Because the middle is a negative 5. Yeah, minus 2 minus 3. That's why I gave this one. Th that bottom one is always tricky. People get caught up on it and they think it's 6 and negative 1 or they think it's negative 6 and positive 1. But it's not. It's because it's a positive 6. These both have to be negative. Right? And now, amazingly, we can cancel. As long as we promise that x won't be 3, which it won't because I'm in a limit, and I carry the limit to the next part, and I write x plus 2 over x minus 2, and I should just be able to direct substitute into this. 5 over 1, 5. If I graph this function, there is a hole at 3. It's undefined. However, as I approach it from both sides, it's a, the function's value is approaching 5. Good? OK. Limit x approaches 4 of 1 over x minus 1 over 4 over x minus 4. Now we're starting to turn it up a little bit. Check the form first. Make sure you have a problem. I do have 0 over 0. Get 1 fourth minus 1 fourth zero. over 4 minus 4. So 0 over 0 is bad. And now we have to do something. In every problem we've done up to this point, at some point we canceled something, didn't we? And that canceling eliminated the problem, didn't it? We need to get some canceling to happen here. We need to somehow get rid of the division by 0, which means that this factor right here, x minus 4, somehow needs to cancel with something. OK, multiply, multiply by reciprocal. I don't want to say no, but what do you mean? Um, multiply by x plus 4. X plus 4? All right, let me give you a um, kind of a rule of thumb. How about that? This is, this is what we refer to as a complex fraction. Fraction within fractions, complex fraction. It's a complicated fraction. When you see a complex fraction like this, my rule of thumb is to always take these two fractions and combine them together first. Get a common denominator between these two. So what would the common denominator be? 4x. That means you have to multiply this first fraction right here by 4 over 4, right? And you have to multiply this fraction over here by x over x. And that will allow you to have the same denominators. Then you can combine them. You all comfortable with that step? You can do that on your own? OK, so we would get limit x goes to 4. See, I'm carrying my limit again. My limit is coming with me. What would the new numerator look like? 4 minus x. 4 minus x over? 4x over x minus 4. That's what it is combined together. Also be aware that this division bar here is longer than this division, division bar up there. Separates our fractions properly. Now what? Do what? 1 over, OK. Are, do you kind of see like these are almost the same? 
Are we off by a sign again? Four positive, four negative. Negative x, positive x. Right? We're off by a sign? But before I do that, I just want to make sure everyone is clear that we do have a fraction over a fraction. Right? We do have a fraction over a fraction. So what I'm going to do on the next step is I'm going to take this fraction and I'm going to flip it up. Division of two fractions, same as multiplication of the reciprocal. So I'm just going to do that. I think that's what you were saying, right? OK. Uh, 4 minus x over 4x times 1 over x minus 4. That's where I am right now. I converted the division into multiplication of the reciprocal. Then I'll factor, yeah, negative 1. It doesn't matter if you take it out of the top or bottom. I'm going to take it out of the top. So let me pull a negative 1 out of these two. So I have negative 1. It turns into negative 4 plus x over 4x times 1 over x minus 4. We good? That's multiply. Now can I cancel them? Yes. yes? Yeah, I have to promise x won't be 4, which it won't. I'll have to write limit one more time. Limit x approaches 4, negative 1 over 4x. That's it. And now direct substitute. Negative 1 over 16. There you go. All right, so that was different than the previous two problems, right? Or previous three? Whatever. We've, up to this point, up to, before this problem, everything was just factoring. And so we can solve some limits with factoring. All your forms of factoring, all of them, <laughs> are on the table now. But here's another problem where we didn't factor. We actually just combine two fractions together and then magically, what we were trying to get to cancel kind of appeared, and we were able to get it to go away. OK? Let's do another one. Is it possible that we're not going to be so nice? Yeah, it could be pretty ugly. Um, but this is the first section, and we're just kind of you know, easing our way into it. Oh, yeah. I can give you an example. Don't write this down. I can give you an example of a limit that right now you can't do and I can't do. Well, I can't do it by showing you an easy way. That is one. That's what was on the quiz. But why is it one? So what form is this? Let x go to 0. What's sine of 0? 0 over 0. OK, so now at this point you have to do something. What do you do? And that's the problem. You can't do anything to this, really. And please don't cancel the x's, OK? <laughs> All right. That would be a what? That would be a sin. That's a bad joke, but OK. It's not, I didn't make it up. All right. So can't blame it on me. There's nothing we can do to this. All right? Can't you change the sign of You could start hammering away at this with trig identities and trust me, the most elegant way to do this requires um, drawing pictures and um, convincing you you can squeeze that value between two other values and it pinches it down in between one, between one and one so it goes to one. It's actually a beautiful um, proof. If you want to see it, you can come to my office. I'll show you. We don't have time in this class for it. It's really nice, though. And then later on, which I hate to say this, but later on, we're going to pull out this magic sword, OK? <laughs> And we're going to look at this, and it's going to be so easy to do. We're going to know it's 1 using this thing called L'Hopital's rule. But you can't have L'Hopital's rule yet. All right. So there are some limits we cannot do, period. I think that's what you're asking. Is there some, there's an example of one we can't do. Um, Yeah, I think it's time for this one. Limit x co goes to 2 of square root of x plus 7 
minus 3 over x minus 2. Is it? Yeah, it looks like it. The one where you were just supposed to plug in values and try and come up with it on the table? Yeah, we're going to be able to do this now. Please verify that this is a problem. Is it? Yeah. Zero over zero. All right, this is zero over zero. This is bad. We've got some algebra to do. Okay, factoring. I don't see any factoring we can do here. Uh, complex fraction, it's not a complex fraction. But it involves radicals. And we do, we do know something about radicals that we've done in the past. The, this thing called the conjugate. Do you remember this thing? Do you remember that word? Conjugate. There's something about this thing called a conjugate that was useful for us when we were rationalizing expressions back in college algebra. Okay? So, so let's talk about a conjugate. What is a conjugate? If, if I give you an expression A plus B, all right? Two terms, right? Being added together. Its conjugate is A minus B. If I give you uh, two terms, A minus B, its conjugate is A plus B. So all you're doing is you rewrite the same two terms, you change the sign between them. Here we have two terms, this minus this. The conjugate will be this plus that. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce the conjugate to the numerator and denominator at the same time. In other words, we're going to multiply by one. But that one is going to be the conjugate over itself. Now, why do we do this? Because it works. That's why it works. Okay, so let me, let me just show you right now. If you take something and its conjugate and you multiply them together, you will always get a squared, a squared minus, b. minus b squared. The middle terms will always cancel each other out, right? A times A is A squared. A times negative B is negative AB. So there would have been a negative AB in here. And then the middle terms would have been positive AB. And those would have gone away. Always, always. That always happens with conjugates. What's good about that? Well, if this is our A, right? If that's our A, then when we, fi when we finish up with it, it's going to be A squared, isn't it? And that means there won't be any root anymore. And then when th if this is our B, when we finish up with it, it'll be B squared. It'll just be 9. And we won't have any radicals anymore on top. We are going to have radicals on the bottom, but it's going to work. All right? So here we go. Limit. See, root x plus 7 minus 3 over x minus 2 times. Here comes the conjugate. I'm going to have the conjugate in a different color. It's so special, it gets its own color. x plus 7 plus 3, right? Same thing on the bottom. Root x plus 7 plus 3. There's your conjugate. We have introduced that ourselves, right? Why did we introduce it? Because we saw radicals. And when we see radicals, we start thinking conjugate. Now I'm going to do the multiplication. So I have to do this, these two terms times these two terms across the top. And I have to do these two terms times these two terms on the bottom, right? Let's do the top first. x plus 7 minus 3, minus 9. Limit, see I didn't, I didn't forget it. Okay, this times this, the root goes away, x plus 7. The middle, the middle 2, right, the next one and the next one, I don't even care about, right? Right, I don't need to care about the next two, is that alright with you? Yes. Yes, you sure? Okay, and then the last one, negative 3 times positive 3, negative 9. So this is what I'm going to have up top. That's, that's not bad, right? Now on the bottom, that's not so nice, right? Because I don't get that same thing to happen. Nope. However, the goal was to no longer have division by 0, right? And this is the part causing division by 0, which means I really want this to cancel, right? So I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to leave it alone. I am not going to multiply this through. If you multiply that through, do you understand that if you start multiplying this out, you're going to make the problem harder than it has to be? Leave it alone. 
and look at look at the numerator. Do you see the numerator? It's perfect, right? This is x minus two. This is x minus two. It's exactly what I needed. It just works that way. So that one would actually be the square root of x plus seven. One over. Well, because you can't have the radical plus. Oh no no you can, you can. Yep. Oh no no, I I I. Okay. Well, we'll have to have that discussion, but I might have to mute my microphone for it. Okay. All right. Let's, <laughs> let's continue. Let's finish this up. This is the limit as x approaches 2, right? What's, uh, what's left? I'm going to cancel the x minus 2s. 1 over square root of x plus 7. 1 over square root of x plus 7 plus 3, right? I will address your, your concern here in a minute about the radical being on the bottom. But right now, can we just do direct substitution, please? And what do you get? This is going to be, I no, I no longer need to write the limit, right? This is 1 over uh, root 9, 3, 3 plus 3, so 1 sixth. The answer is 1 sixth. And we're done. This times this. You probably wouldn't see the cancellation. You would lose the cancellation. See how in this next step I canceled? After you expand this all out, you're not going to see that anymore. Okay. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be out of your vision and you're going to be off on some other road. And you may find your way back, but it, it'll be a long, long path probably. So keep it in mind. The thing that you're trying to eliminate, the thing that's causing the division by zero, just don't ever like make it go away, right? Keep it on the bottom and then hope that it appears on the top. Now, can I address, what was your name? Melina. Melina, okay. So if you would have seen this, you automatically want to rationalize that? Yeah, like I yeah. want to move the... Yeah. So, you know, in college algebra, we teach rationalizing things. We do it because we know here you're going to need it. Like we know that you're going to need to do this sort of thing in, in calculus. You need to be able to multiply these together. So there is value to knowing how to multiply radicals and things like this. It's all, it's important as far as algebraic skills. However, it is not true that you can never leave a radical in the denominator, okay? It's not like a huge violation of the math rules or something. Here's why. It's, it's actually historical, and I'm actually going to have to spend a little time talking about it. But I'll take five minutes. All right, we've all seen this. One over root two, right? And we've probably been told, don't ever leave your answer like that. How many of you have kind of been told, don't ever leave your answer like that? Yeah? Okay. Why? Any explanation as to why? No? So tell me what you would do to not, to not leave it like this. You would... You would uh, Multiply top and bottom by root 2, and that would be root 2 over 2. Now, if you get on your calculator and you type in 1 divided by root 2, right, you're going to get an answer. And if you type in root 2 divided by 2, you're going to get the same answer. These are the exact same numbers. So why is it that you are being told, and I'm not telling you this, okay, why have you been told that you must do this? Here's why, and it's actually kind of funny. Back before calculators, before calculators, these things had to be computed by hand. And so imagine that you had to compute this by hand. You would go back to your old school division, and you would do 1 in the division box, and outside you would have root 2, right? Now, there were certain roots that came up a lot. Root 2 is one of them. So people would have those memorized. So like back in the day, before calculators, like the level, the level of your math dorkiness was measured on like how many numbers you knew. Like I know the square root of two is, uh, you know, blah, 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 1.414, and, and I know that pi is 3.14, and I know that e is 2.71. And it's like how dorky you were, were, were not only how many of them you knew, but how far out you knew them. Like 